In this video, we're going to be covering the fourth topic in the course on data types and data structures. This course being specifically for the LXL GCSE Computer Science qualification. Uh, I've actually, if you're following the specification, which I would definitely recommend, you'll see that I've switched these two topics. There's actually, I mean, I've probably said in my previous video, I'm doing constructs next, but actually, that's going to be in the next video. Uh, it makes slightly more sense swapping the topics around. And also, the fifth point of this topic on uh, global and local variables is also going to be in the next video because again it just makes it makes more sense and um, but we are going to start this video by looking at the concept of the data type so humans instinctively recognize the type of data from our own knowledge we know that 11.62 is a decimal number we've learned that at some point we've also learned that there are certain operations that can be done on this number we can divide it we can square root it we can represent it as a fraction there's certain things that can be done to that number um, computers can't do this instinctively, so we need to classify the types of data and then tell the computer when we're using them. So that's about declaring the data type, uh, something we'll look at in the next video. And the data type determines certain properties, like what operations can be conducted on the data and how the data will be stored. So um, as quite a clear example of how the data type matters, I guess, uh, depending on the type, 5 plus 6 could equal 11 or it could equal 56. So um, here we are um, essentially telling the computer that this this is a, uh, a character and we're telling it here that it's an integer and the operation is quite different depending on the data type. So that's just a simple uh, example. Um, you need to know of five data types for your exam. So the first one, um, and these are the five data types that are pretty much going to be built in at a minimum to every programming language. Um, you can also define your own data types, but that's probably a bit beyond this course. So an integer is any whole number, so 8, 35, 9, you know, <laughs> the list literally goes on. Um, the second one is real or a float. Um, this is either or, they're two different terms for the same data type. I usually say float, um, but it doesn't matter. Don't write real slash float, just choose one. Um, for example, we'll accept, e accept either. And these are numbers with the decimal part of it. Um, they're not a whole number, they've got this decimal part. Um, in some cases, this would be 2.0 would be treated as a integer, but really, I would argue that 2.0, the zero still has meaning. Um, it, it could be rounded, it could be to uh, two significant figures, it still has some meaning. Um, and the third one is Boolean, so the Boolean data type is one of two values, so it's either true or false, uh, or one or zero. Um, we'll look at this binary Boolean um, case in future videos. And a character is, what well, I've mentioned, is just a letter, number, or symbol in a given character set. Um, so. Uh, a character set is something like ASCII, Unicode, again I've been saying this a lot, something we're going to cover later, but um, uh, it can be used to form a string and a string is a sequence of characters. Sometimes a, the character is defined as a string of length 1, but that varies language to language and doesn't matter so much. So if we now look at variables slightly more formally, I know we've touched on them in previous videos, a variable is a location in the memory containing data values. And this memory location is paired with an identifier, which is the unique name we give it. We've talked about descriptive variable names and the variable name is what's known as the identifier. And so this uh, definition is taken, so you, you might see this definition in different formats or written differently. And that's because some languages take this more literally than others. So a language like C++, this would be taken quite literally, this definition, but in others like Python, really a variable is just a value that can change and that's probably a better way for you, for you to think about it. This might be how you would write it in the exam, but that's probably how you should think about it. And so, as I say, despite the name, the data type and the location being fixed, the values can change during the program's execution. And that contrasts with a constant, and a constant is an identifier associated with values that remain fixed during the program's execution. So these values do not change. And if we do a bit of a physics lesson here, uh, very briefly, I couldn't think of a better, better example. Um, if you're going to calculate the weight of an object, you might have the following variable. And this is in uh, C sharp, which if you're doing that, great. But if you don't, this probably looks a bit strange to you. Maybe we'll decompose this in the next uh, topic. But really, we're doing we're declaring this variable as a float, 
and we are assigning it to another variable mass times 9.81 and so in physics Newton's second law of a weight is done by timesing uh, the mass times the acceleration and 9.81 is the acceleration due to gravity on earth and so on earth this is constant hence why I went with it and instead of doing this we could actually just declare and use a constant so this is me declaring a constant and assigning it calling it G that's our identifier and assigning it to 9.81 and that means in our uh, variable we're going to replace 9.81 with this constant and well you might say why would we do this well there's a few reasons first of all just very very quickly uh, if we just address why variables are used that is because certain values are known when you're writing the code you you're writing code that's going to have future inputs but you want to be able to use them in the future and so you use variables in expressions and statements you don't know when you're declaring this what the mass is going to be. The mass could be something inputted by the user and the variable, um, the concept of a variable in maths as well is something, is an unknown value. Um, that's just a very side note because I mean you haven't really got an alternative to a variable. Instead of a constant you could just use a variable um, but why should a constant be used? Well constant, constants help readability. I know we've talked a lot about readability but not everyone maintaining the code will know the relevance and understand what uh, the literal values mean. A named constant makes it clear. So a literal is 9.81 for example. It's just something that literally is what it is. Um, mass so mass is going to represent something else. 9.81 literally represents 9.81. Um, but I wouldn't worry too much about that. But really, a constant, it's got a name. It's going to help for code, which is similar to basically the same as descriptive variable names. Um, also, constants, and this is the main reason, is that constants make it a lot easier to update. So when you're executing the program, the constant value won't change. But if you need to actually change the general program, so as I say, 9.81 is the acceleration due to gravity on Earth. On the Moon, it's different though, it's less. And so if you want to update the whole program, instead of going through every single instance of 9.81 and changing it, all you have to do is change G in this one declaration, probably right at the start of the program. So that's how it is a lot better to use a constant in that circumstance. So you know, if I was an examiner, I would definitely ask the question, why would you use a constant? And this would be the main reason I would talk about. Also, um, uh, it helps with compiler optimization. We'll look at the compiler, uh, what a compiler is later, and this is probably slightly beyond your specification, but use of name constants can lead to certain op optimizations, so either improving the performance or reducing memory space. Um, so as an example, expressions involving constants can be evaluated at compile time instead of during runtime, time, which helps, and that's called constant folding if you're interested. And it should be said that not all compilers uh, optimize in this way. So really I would talk about the first two reasons if you're looking at, if you're being asked about why constants should be used. So we've touched on data structures before briefly but we're going to expand on it now so the textbook definition of data structure is it's the conceptual arrangement of data so we view text we associate text as being a long line of characters um, I think for our purposes it's pretty best if we um, I wouldn't say ignore but not focus on this definition too much because there's two uh, main ways you can look at data structures. You can look at them in terms of their ab abstract properties, and that's more what this is talking about, or you can look at them in terms of their implementation, and I think that's much more what we're going to be focusing on. So there's a number of different data structures because there's a number of different m methods for storing large amounts of data. When I say large, you know, we're talking basically more than one. And different data structures organize data in different ways. You would have used when you're coding different data structures, you probably would have used arrays, which we'll look at in a sec, but also tuples, records, uh, linked lists, um, which you're not going to cover in detail, but you probably would have used. Um, and different data structures enable data to be processed in different ways. So they add efficiency because they're designed specifically for different purposes. Um, and so um, you can, I would say, ignore the, the labels here, but the point is um, this image is just trying to show you the different 
visualizations of data structures but ignore the labels because they may be misleading um, so we've got to look at arrays that are specified by the exam board so an array is a data structure which stores data under a single identifier name by index position because of this identifier name um, I've often seen it described as being like a variable that stores multiple elements I would you I mean you're welcome to think like that but I would personally not write that as a definition I'd stick this as a de stick to this as a definition because just um, comparing it to a variable um, could be compl complicated but uh, it might be a good way to remember it um, and generally we say arrays have a fixed length so when you first use them you often have to specify how long they're going to be so it can reserve memory space and they often um, or usually only contain elements of the same data type so all integers all strings etc although there are instances where I've seen I mean sometimes they're called something different um, to differentiate them from these sort of typical arrays but in some languages um, they're more flexible um, so that's why I say generally and data is stored uh, sorry data is accessed by referencing the elements in next position so the index position is the position of the element so in terms of these images it's for squares is the element and index indexing usually starts counting from zero zero indexing usually um, I imagine if it's a question unless it says something else assume it starts from zero and that means we start you know for this vector data type uh, data structure uh, zero one two that's our index position um, so yes uh, if we look at uh, sort of um, two types of arrays uh, the first one being a one-dimensional array and a one-dimensional array stores the data in one direction so um, often visualized as being horizontal and this is the vector which I was just saying that's why I said to ignore the labels because they have different names depending on what context you're looking at them um, so this is pseudocode uh, Edexcel pseudocode for uh, setting an array so this is our identifier name called names and if we want to access one of these elements this is the format in pseudocode we might use this is our index position one we're going to be zero indexing and so Alice is zero, Bob's one, Charlie's two, and so we're going to get Bob returned to us. A two-dimensional array differs in that it stores data horizontally and vertically, and so you can visualize it as a table. And so often they're described as arrays of arrays. Um, again, a bit like the variable um, analogy. It's, I'd think about it like that, but maybe don't write it in an exam because there are different yeah um, but you can see why you might describe it like that because it looks like we have three or three arrays within a main array and the index this is the main the index of two numbers instead of one so this is again some pseudocode from the exam board and this is about updating an element or setting an element in a specific index position so the row index goes first from the column index in terms of your parameters and so this code in for this example sending these elements to display like printing these elements and two is our row so the way I think about it is the row goes along the bottom like it does in a table and then the column is horizontal so <laughs> that, may, that may be of no help but the row is sort of a position along of the arrays within the array and then we sort of go further so I'm sure that made no sense but essentially what we get back is H from doing this because we're going 0 1 2 so it's going to be in this sub array and then we're moving on to the sort of column position which is going to be 0 1 so we get H back um, and this is the table kind of form which we're storing this is the row index and this is the column index so maybe pause the video if that's totally confused you um, I can't think of a better way to sort of express it uh, but to finish this video we need to look very briefly at manipulating strings so this is one of the specification points I could have chalked down as being one I wouldn't go over because it's more about you having done it in programming and not as much for the exam but very very briefly we'll just go over some examples of operations you can do on strings so the first one is position as an example and this it finds the position of the first occurrence of a specified character so it works like the zero indexing even though it's of strings so e 
in Hello World is the second position for character in the second position of this string but because we're starting counting from zero we get one back and it's the first occurrence of world and world exists uh, ex world uh, is first in the starts of the sixth character if we're doing zero indexing uh, concatenation is what we looked at right at the start of the video and that's joining strings together which I think was five plus six was for example and it often shares the same operator as addition um, and finally you can convert between strings so uh, to similar data types so if we make 5.2 in a string a float we can change it to 5.2 we can make 65 as an integer into a string and we can convert 8 as a string into an integer so a very very quick example there to show you what maybe this means in case you were wondering but anyway that's it for today's video uh, we will be looking at constructs next so so yeah hopefully this video was useful